And welcome to the Mouthpiece Moment UFC 283 main card preview. I'm going to break down the five fights that are on the main card, the pay-per-view section. Uh, just give you a little insight on each fighter and each fight, who I think is going to win. Um, just really excited to do something like this. This is something I do anyway when I watch fights. I have people over. I uh, I break down the fights. I explain to people who aren't fans a little bit about what's going on, what to look for, something to keep in mind. It makes it easier to watch. Um, I'm really excited about this card. First fight in about three years at the UFC has been in Brazil. Brazil's the mecca of the UFC, the mecca of MMA, back, going back to the Valle Dudo days. Uh, the, the Gracie family created the, the UFC. Um, so whenever the, there's fights in Brazil, it's always nuts. They have crazy fans, crazy fans chanting and screaming and booing. And the, the most famous chant, the, Oh boy, mojere, oh boy, mojere. Uh, and, the trans the, the like English translation for that is you're gonna die, you're gonna die, you're gonna die, which which the Brazilian fans scream at non Brazilian fighters. It's their way of like booing or letting you know you're gonna get knocked out, like you know, basically having the back of their of their fighter. Um there's fifteen fights total on this card, which is kind of wild. There's usually eleven to twelve on, on a regular UFC card. This one has fifteen, so you can tell you know it's a big deal. Um Shogun Hua is a legendary fighter. He'll be a he'll be in the Hall of Fame in the UFC. Um, had his, had, it's his retirement fight. It's his, I mean, finally, it's been about. I mean, it probably should have happened three, four years ago, maybe five years ago. Um, he's he's had a twenty year MMA career. Uh, he started out at the Shoot the Box Gym, which is a legendary gym in MMA. That's where Vanderlei Silva fought both the cyborgs, his brother Ninja. Um, there's all these crazy stories about the early Shoot the Box days. Um, look that up. Uh, he was a 2005 Pride middleweight champion, which uh, I'm sorry, Pride middleweight Grand Prix tra champion. So he fought like three times in one night back when he was just destroying people with soccer kicks and stomps and all that stuff. He's also a former UFC light heavyweight champion. Um, he was the last champion before John Jones. He lost his title to John Jones. So um, I'm not going to lie. I'm probably going to get a little teary eyed when Shogun leaves on this one, but that's all right. Love Shogun, pumped about it. Now let's get right into the main card opener. Awesome and an awesome card. I'm sorry, awesome fight. Very smart for the UFC to go with this fight as the main card opener because it's almost guaranteed fireworks, guaranteed finish in my in my opinion. Um, it's a light heavyweight fight. That's 205. Uh, Paul Craig, number nine in the world, and John Walk Johnny John Walker, motherfucker Johnny Walker, who's ranked twelve. Um, this is a really exciting fight. Paul Craig is six four. He comes from Scotland. Um, real interesting guy. He always comes in uh, at the weigh-ins with blue face paint, a la Braveheart, the movie. Um, he's a real intense guy. I, I think he's really intelligent. That's something that comes out a lot in his fighting style and when he talks and has interviews. Um, I, when he first came out, I was kind of annoyed that he was so confrontational at weigh-ins and getting in people's face. I thought he was an asshole. Uh, but then I started to understand more about the psych psychology of being a fighter and all this and what he was preparing himself for. So to me, he's super interesting. Um, he's a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, a submission specialist. He actually got his black belt after uh, a TKO victory over tonight's main event title contender, uh, Jamal Hill. That was back in June of 2021. Um, it was kind of a weird, crazy situation. He uh, was he, he had Jamal Hill's arm all twisted up, ended up dislocating his elbow. Um, the ref didn't really stop the fight. It was kind of gross looking. And he had him in. Uh, he pulled guard, pulled Jamal in, and uh, just starts hammer fisting him. Once that arm was flopping around all crazy, he's landing hammer fists from the bottom, which normally isn't a way you win a fight. Uh, but the ref finally caught wind and saw that the arm was flopping around all crazy. So it goes down as a TKO victory, but really he destroyed Jamal Hill's arm. Um, and so the, after that fight, his coach awarded him his black belt. He's a submission specialist, so that's his whole game. You got to look out for his ground game. Um, his last performance was kind of a lackluster performance against uh, Vulcan Uzdemir. He was just kind of pulling guard against Vulcan. Vulcan sort of stayed out of his guard and landed some punches, stayed out of trouble, and ended up winning. Um, kind of a boring, not maybe not boring, just an uneventful sort of victory. So I'm, I know he's looking to bounce back from that. 
Johnny Walker probably doesn't want to play around in uh, Paul Craig's guard because Paul Craig's a legit T-City. No offense, Brian Ortega. I love you too. But this dude is always looking for the triangle and arm bars. And when he grabs a hold of somebody's arm, it gets it gets real nasty. Um, his opponent is Johnny Walker, who's a Brazilian. 6'6". Six, six, Jesus fucking Christ. That's a big boy. 6'6", six, six, 205. Um, he's a fan favorite type of fighter. Real fun to watch because he's got flashy knockouts, crazy big, heavy strikes. Um, he's kind of a, he used to be really silly, uh, which is sort of his, was his trademark. He seemed to calm down a little bit, grow up a little bit. Um, always dancing on the way into the octagon. He's a fun guy to watch. I like watching Johnny Walker fight. Um, his he he started off in the UFC with three straight wins. People were starting to talk about how. He's going to be fighting John Jones soon, and him and John Jones were kind of throwing a few words at each other here and there on social media, but nothing really ever came of it because after those three wins, he went two and four. Um, so he's on not a great stretch as of right now, but um, but it, it, things are looking better. Um, he got KO'd by, again, Jamal Hill. He got knocked out by Jamal Hill in February of 2022, but he was actually doing pretty well in that fight up until the point where he got caught. So it wasn't like he got mopped up or anything. He he did pretty well. Stayed. He was uh, landing some some decent strikes from the outside, um, and he just got caught. But then he came back in September of 2022 and uh, fought when he fought Yiwan Kutelaba, who's mostly known as a grappler. Um, not I mean he's got good strikes, but he's mostly a grappler, uh, heavy wrestling and stuff like that. He ended up getting a rear naked choke over Iwan with Kudelaber, which seemed very uh, surprising to a lot of people. That fight should have been more of a grappler versus striker striker type of fight. Um, but I mean, hey, you don't sleep on his ground game. He ended up pulling off a rear naked choke against a grappler. I think um, it's very possible for this fight to go either way. I think all five fights are pretty much that way they're very they're gonna be very close the UFC did a great job at putting these fights together on this card in Brazil I do think Johnny Walker is gonna get the knockout I think um it's just I, I was I was really on the edge on this one uh Johnny Walker I think he's gonna take the energy in a positive way that he gets from the crowd and I think he's gonna land a big shot on Paul Craig and I think he's gonna be just smart enough to stay out of that guard I think Paul Craig's going to invite him down there, and I think there's going to be um, uh, the invitation and the, the 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 want to go in there and prove himself is going to be there, but I think he's going to be smart enough to stay out of that guard, and I think he's going to get a big knockout win, and I think it's going to be a great way to start the card off. So, uh, I mean, I could totally see Paul Craig getting a submission uh, if Johnny Walker decides that he wants to play down there. And Johnny Walker's not bad on the ground either. I, I wouldn't be surprised... Uh, if he went into his guard and, and did well enough to get out of there. I don't know that he's going to win by submission, so I'll just stick to Johnny Walker by KO. Um, second fight on the card is a flyweight uh, women's, women's fight uh, between number four ranked Lauren Murphy and number six ranked Jessica Andrade. Um, this is a, a great fight, real good matchup. Um, Lauren Murphy is an American fighter. Uh, she, she went on a five-fight win streak before losing a fight against... The, uh, you know, longtime champ, Valentina Shevchenko. So, n you know, nothing nothing bad there. I mean, everyone who's fought Valentina Shevchenko at 125 is lost. So that's just how, how it goes. Um, she Her last fight, she had one fight after that against Misha Tate. Kind of an uneventful, you know, decision win. That was a July 2022. So she's coming off that. Um, she had a real career resurgence in 2019. That's when it seemed to, she seemed to really... Um, feel better about training she seemed to have a, a much better feeling about where she was training and um she's 39 right now so she's pretty old in the mma world um so i'm not really sure how that's going to hold up against jessica andrage she is tough as fuck though she's a i'm sorry fug sorry that i cussed uh i'm actually not sorry but she's a dog she's super tough um she doesn't really get bullied anywhere she's got great jujitsu great wrestling good clinch game her striking has gotten a lot better um so that's something that might help her stay away but i think she's going to want to hang out in the clinch and it, it, that's her game her game plan i'm sorry uh, i i'm sorry not her game plan it's her game is being in the clinch world but she's fighting against Jessica Andraj who thrives in the in the clinch as well being usually the undersized fighter the shorter fighter that's more of a um 
a strength type fighter, uh, big heavy punches, but she, I mean, she's, she's a beast. She's a former UFC strawweight champion. Um, and she's going to have the crowd on her side. She's a Brazilian legend at this point. I'm, I'm sure she will be a hall of fame fighter as well. Um, one thing I will say, she takes a lot of damage early on in her fights. It's sort of like her feeling out process. Um, especially, like I said, she's not a tall fighter, um, in either the strawweight division or the flyweight division. She's undersized in both, um, as far as her height goes. So she's usually having to find her range by taking some shots against whoever she's fighting. Um, she's known as Bache Azteca, which in Portuguese, well, it translates in English to pile driver. Um, very strong. She was, she's, was always known for her slams, for being able to, you know, out muscle, her opponents, um, and the last time she fought in the arena they're fighting in tonight was uh, when she took the strawweight belt from uh, then champion Rose Namajunas by slamming her on her head and knocking her out. I don't know if you guys saw that; it's pretty crazy. Um, that's how that that's how that went. Um, her only loss at flyweight was to again the goat Valentina Shevchenko. That's her only loss at flyweight. I think she will do well in this division moving forward. Um, I, it was, again, hard to pick. I went with Andrade by unanimous decision. I originally wrote down that she was going to win by submission. Uh, kind of changed my mind because I'm, I just think about more and more about how tough um, Laura Murphy is. And it's hard for me to just say, yeah, she's going to you know get submitted right away. I think she has good enough jiu-jitsu to, to stay uh, out of the danger zone. But I could also see um, Jessica Andrade winning by TKO, like a ground and pound style referee stoppage. So, um, this fight, that fight out of the five fights might end up being possibly the fight of the night. I would say it could be, um, I'm not really going to go over any of the other previous fights. Some of those could be too. Um, next fight is a welterweight fight between number five, Gilbert Burns and number 12, Neil Magny. Um, another interesting fight, uh, real difference in height. Gilbert Burns is a five ten, not that big. For, he's actually you know undersized for his uh, for his division, one hundred seventy pounds. He's a he's a Brazilian, um, four time Jiu Jitsu world champion. Uh, his last fight was against uh, Hamza Chemaev, which everyone really thought was an amazing fight. Uh, Hamza was kind of just tearing through the, the two divisions. Um, calling everybody out, saying he'll fight anyone, anytime, anywhere. A lot of fighters were just not down. Gilbert Burns was like, I'm in. Let's do this. Really close fight, and I think he really humbled Hamzat, um, and I loved it. I, I was bummed that, he, that Gilbert lost the fight, but um, it was some moral victory to the fact that he really humbled Hamzat, and Hamzat had to really, uh, after the fight, he said in the interview that he basically, you know, got taught a lesson that he has to change his, his training. Cause he, he's usually the, the, you know, the bully and, uh, he wasn't allowed to bully Gilbert Burns. I, I'm a big Gilbert Burns fan. He's a real anytime, anywhere type of fighter. He he's down to fight anyone. He's been calling everybody out. Um, feels like people aren't accepting his fight, his fight, his call outs. Um, again, four time Brazilian world jujitsu champion. He's his jujitsu is, is, is super, super sharp. Um, very strong fighter. His striking has has vastly improved. He's been knocking people. I mean, he was knocking people out years ago. A lot more close fights now because he's fighting top upper echelon type fighters. Um, but he's got hands. He's got good hooks. Great boxing. Um, he's really good everywhere. Uh, he's been called the most complete fighter in the division in the welterweight division. Um, I agree with that. He's he's the most complete. He's great striking. Uh, people don't really mess with his jiu-jitsu that much unless it's Hamza who believes he's better than everyone. Also, he was born in Rio de Janeiro, so that's a big deal. Big hometown pop. Uh, the crowd's going to definitely be on his side. Give me a second. Oh, that was lovely. That was a cheers to Gilbert Burns. Uh, Neil Magny is an American six foot three, so there's a huge five-inch uh, gap here between Gilbert Burns and Neil Magny. Neil Magny is the all-time uh, win leader in the UFC welterweight division with 20 wins. So that's pretty, you know, that's a pretty big deal to win that many wins. He um, he eclipsed, uh, he beat uh, GSP's uh, record. He was a previous holder, and, and now Neil Magny has that. And uh, his last fight when he fought Daniel Rodriguez, he ended up winning that fight uh, and uh, called out Gilbert Burns because Gilbert Burns has been saying nobody wants to fight me. It was a smart move to get Neil Magny to move up up the ranks. He called out Gilbert Burns, but it was it was like a respectful call out. It wasn't a shit talking call out. It was like, a, hey, I'm down if you're down um 
So that was in November of 2022. He was, uh, I will say he was taking a lot of big shots from Daniel Rodriguez in the first two rounds. Um, a lot of, you know, a lot of big body shots and, 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 uh, I don't know that he would be able to take the same shots from Gilbert Burns. I'm not saying Daniel Rodriguez doesn't have power cause he definitely has power, but I just feel like Gilbert Burns is a step above. Um, so he's gonna have to sort of stick to his guns of fighting very long, which is what he does. He's six, three. So he fights long, great Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, um, really good wrestling, good clinch game. He's a great game planner. Him and his team do very well at planning what they're going to do. Um, I think he's going to have to stay on the outside, stay away from, he's probably going to have to stay away from the clinch as well because Gilbert Burns can do it all, man. And his, his jujitsu is elite. Um, one thing he has going, another thing he has going for him is he is usually able to dictate where the fight goes. So, uh, that usually helps him out. Unfortunately, I think, uh, Burns is going to win by submission. Um, I think it would be a big deal for him to get a submission victory in Rio de Janeiro um, in front of the hometown crowd. And I think he's going to have a really good, I'm just predicting, I think he's going to have a really good call out after this. I think he's going to have a really good promo that's going to really extend him and, and, and look really look really great. So watch out for a submission there by Gilbert Burns. I, that, that's my call. Now, uh, now on to the two title fights. Uh, the first title fight of the night, and the, the fight I consider the real main event, is the flyweight title bout. That's 125 pounds b- between Davison Figueiredo and Brandon Moreno. That's right, my boy, Brandon Moreno. Brandon, I want you to be my friend. I want us to be pals because you're an absolute fucking sweetheart of a man and a badass in the octagon. Thanks for listening. I know you're watching. Uh, Davison Figueiredo. Actually, th- what's crazy about this fight is this is the fourth time these guys are going to fight. Uh, they fought three times, and their rec- the, the record or the, uh, you know, I guess the record of, the, of their fights is one, one, and one. One Each fighter has one win and one loss, and, and they, they had a draw. The first time they fought, they fought to a draw. Um, Brandon Moreno had like a short notice fight. And uh, it, it was a short notice fight for him, and they fought to a draw. The second fight, Brandon Moreno, uh, tapped him with a rear naked choke um and that was the only finish out of the the three fights that's something important to to think about because there's i'll explain that why in a little bit but the third fight the most recent fight was a razor close decision um heavily disputed but they gave it the 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 the, uh, judges gave it to davison figueredo um so davison is a brazilian the again 125 pounds he used to have some some trouble making weight made weight just fine in all these fights um heavy strikes solid ground game really deadly chokes um you know you you can't fuck around and try to take him down in a, in a real soft way because he has great a great guillotine choke he has a great rear naked choke um he spent time in his last training camp not this one but the one before at fight ready in arizona uh training with henry cejudo in that camp and a lot of people have been giving henry cejudo a lot of props on how intelligent he is how great of a game planner he is um how passionate he is about mma so i think that really helped him out in the last fight with his wrestling and just sort of game planning and and not being just wild um but according to the ufc countdown I, i watched um, he spent his entire, this is according to him, he spent his entire training camp, this camp in Belém, Brazil, which is where his hometown where he's from. So I don't know that he had a whole lot of involvement with uh, Fight Ready. That might be, that might hurt him, um, but we'll see what happens. Uh, Davison, to me, th- what's really weird about Davison Figueiredo during this whole in the trilogy, in the first three fights, is he's he's always been kind of a bully. He just he's just a bully type of person. There's a lot of psycho, and I'm gonna get psychological here now. There's a lot of psychological um, projecting and a lot of insecurity that I that I notice because he's he's always trying to t- say out in public that Brandon Moreno is afraid of him, that he fears him. But they fought three times already, and the only one that won with a finish was Brandon Moreno. So I don't, there is, there is no real fear there. They've fought three times. I don't know how you'd be afraid the fourth time you fight somebody. But anyway, um, that's just something to think about too, that there's a lot of projection there. A lot of, um, if you watch the weigh-ins, he kind of gets in his face and pushes him and all this. And, uh, Brandon Moreno just handles it like a G. This is going to sound, obviously it sounds all like, Oh, I'm all, I'm, I'm, I'm a Brandon Moreno fan. I'm being partial. I am. I, I am being partial because I, I seem to like him. I like him as a fighter, and I just feel like I'm not really into Davidson Figueiredo's whole bully 
style thing, but um, that's okay. Brandon Moreno is a Mexican fighter, so I guess I am also partial there, pal. Um, first, he's actually the firstborn Mexican UFC champion. That's an interesting uh, point to to remember because he took the title from Davidson Figueiredo in the second fight, and that's when he choked him out. Um, really big deal for Mexico, big deal for him. He became this huge star, um, and he's actually the only fighter to ever finish uh, Davidson Figueiredo. That's another important factor because the only other person he uh, Figueiredo lost to was uh, Hussier or Jussier Formiga, um, which both of these guys have fought. Um, and uh, yeah, so the other there's a lot of I mean maybe not issues, but there's a lot of things going against Brandon Moreno in this fight. Um, he's obviously fighting in enemy territory in Brazil, but I I don't think that. Figueiredo's quite a um, like a like a big hero in Brazil. It, the pops were a lot weren't as big for him, um, and the crowd wasn't as into him leading up to the fight. And, the, and you know, the, in the last week or so, a lot of the tape I watched and stuff, he's not as well known as other UFC fighters. Um, another thing I, sh- I should have said this earlier. Back to being you know insecure, he's constantly wearing uh, sunglasses indoors. As, and this. Some people might be like, you're reading too much into this, but I, I really pay attention to people's um, actions and their body language, and I've, I just see a lot of that in him. Um, but anyway, back to Brandon Moreno. There, he's fighting in enemy territory. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with the James Krause betting scandal, but James Krause is a pretty intelligent coach slash fighter in the UFC. He owns his own gym in Missouri, and a lot of fighters who fight under him do very well. Um, he's really good like insanely good at breaking down uh fights i always thought whenever i I love listening to him talk about fights um and he uh brandon went over to his camp and james kraus was his head coach for the last fight and he kind of had something good going on there and then this betting scandal happened long story short james uh, James kraus got kicked out of the ufc um and all the other fighters were told that if you train under James Krause or if you train with James Krause, you will not be allowed to fight in the UFC. So Brandon Moreno, who lives in Vegas, had to figure something else out. And so uh, kind of a weird situation because it was about five weeks left until the fight. So he teamed up with uh, Coach uh, Sa- 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 Saif Saud. Damn, now that I'm saying it live, I, I practiced this like a bunch of times saying his name. So I was like, oh, it might be weird. Even... I'm trying to say it live and it's I'm all I'm fucked up. Jesus Christ. Coach Say Sayif Saif Sayud. Sorry, dude. Uh, from Fortis MMA, the head coach and owner there um, decided to, to ha- take him under his wing and kind of help out. Not really change the game too much, but just kind of make sure that he has a general somebody there who's going to help him through the process and be with him. Um, so he's been with uh, he's been training in Vegas with this coach for for about the last five weeks. Um, he also teamed up with famed. Mexican boxing coach Jorge uh, Capetillo, who has trained uh, Andy Ruiz, uh, has done some work with Tyson Fury. Um, I don't know a whole lot about him, but he seemed to be a big deal um, with the research I did. So um, hopefully his boxing is a lot sharper. Uh, he's just he's fighting at a disadvantage in this situation, but he's got a huge heart. Um, he's got the Mexican fighting spirit, which we all know about is, is a big deal. Um I, I'm I'm feeling really good about this fight. It might end up being another, you know, crazy fourth chapter of this fight, and, I, and I'm sure it will be. Both guys are real tough. But both guys are durable. Both guys are want to win. Um, I, I got the the TJ kill. I got Brandon Moreno winning this fight by submission. I think he's going to get another submission victory, and I think Davison Figueiredo is going to say, "Oh yeah, you know, it's too hard to cut uh, down," which it probably is. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, and I think he's going to move up to bantamweight and start contending at that uh, at that level. Um, I just, I just, I've know what I've noticed psychologically that's been pretty much the same, but specifically different this time is Brandon Moreno has been practicing stoicism. I think I saw a book or something that in one of the clips um, looked that up. So in the in the weigh-ins, it was very clear that there's a psychological difference. Um, Brandon was, had his hands behind his back, stoic look on his face, almost non-reactive until one point. Um, Davidson Vicajero was trying to upset Brandon, trying to get him, picking at him, trying to get him to react. And, of course, it, it didn't really work. Um, I think Brandon Moreno's not going to be too phased by the crowd and I think that Davison's really hoping to have a psychological edge over Brandon Moreno, but he just doesn't. So um, 
I don't think the crowd's going to be big enough advantage to really end it. But you know, honestly, I could see Davison Figueredo taking it too. I just my my heart and head choice is Brandon Moreno. So, um, so we're gonna go to the uh, main event. Even though the real main event was the last one, the main event fight is a uh, light heavyweight title bout. That's 205 pounds between Glover Teixeira, who's ranked number two, and Jamal Hill, who's ranked number seven. Um, this title is vacant, so nobody's the champion champion currently. Uh, Yuri Prohaska won the title over Glover Teixeira. Um, then they set up a rematch. He had, had to pull out of the rematch with a, a really bad shoulder injury that, that could possibly keep him out for a year. Um, Jan Blakovich fought Mag- Magomed Ankalaev for the vacant title uh, last month. I think it might have been December 10th. Um, and they ended up fighting uh, to a draw. Really good fight, but it, it was a draw. Um and there was some weird stuff with uh, Magomed's side where he was really complaining, and there was a lot of controversy around that. He was blaming the UFC. I don't think he quite understood how judges work. Um, but that night, Dana White said, hey, you know, him and the, the matchmakers decided that they're, we're going to redo, we're going to do this fight. We need to figure out how to put a belt on somebody. So they announced that next month, which is today, um, that it was going to be Glover Teixeira versus Jamal Hill for the for the vacant title. Um, a little background on Glover. Glover's a 43 year old fighter, uh, former UFC light heavyweight champion. Again, he he dropped the belt uh, to Yuri Pro- Pro- Jesus Christ, Yuri Prohachka. Sorry, uh, and uh, he didn't win the fight. He didn't win the title until he was 42. So that's kind of a big deal. Uh, the first fighter to ever win the title that late in life. Um, there were some 40 year old title holders, but they were, I, I believe I'm getting this right. They were already title holders at like 39 or 38 and then, you know, carried it over. Um, he's a high level Brazilian Jiu Jitsu practitioner, really great boxing. Um, but he's really mostly deadly in his grappling. Uh, if you go to the ground with him, it's, it's going to be a rough night, uh, really good in transitions, durable type of fighter. Um, and this will be the 10th time that he's headlining a UFC event. That's really important to to know because um, Jamal Hill, this might be his third maybe or something like that, but Glover's got the experience um, advantage for sure, and he's a Brazilian fighter, um, so he's going to have the crowd behind him. 18 wins by KO and uh, 10 wins by submission. Um, he's been receiving a sort of a hero's welcome uh, this week. I'm wondering if... Uh, that's good or bad because he's been really hanging out with a lot of people. Um, just has that sort of elder statesman thing going on where he's just, you know, meeting a lot of people, taking a lot of pictures. It could be good, could be bad. Um, Jamal Hill is an American fighter, uh, six and one in the UFC, and his only loss was actually to Paul Craig, who we talked about earlier, and that was, you know, a dislocated elbow, just shredded. Um, all of his UFC victories have come by KO or TKO. Crazy lightning hands. Um, he seems to have a I wouldn't say a weird style of striking, but an interesting style of striking. Um, and when his hands land, people just, they just die. They just disintegrate. Um, he's got a really good mindset, um, very aggressive, very confident, but it doesn't seem cocky. He started out a little cocky, which a lot of people do when they're, when they're new and they're hungry and, and they feel like, Hey, I have to act extra tough and I have to be extra confident to be able to get this done. But, uh, he's really matured a lot from what I've seen. Um, has a good team behind him that really believes him. He he believes. I'm sorry, that believes in him, and he believes in his team. Um, his wrestling uh, and fight IQ have really improved. Uh, that that's there's evidence in that. In his last fight against uh, Tiago Santos, that was a five five round fight. Um, it ended in the fourth round, I believe. And uh, there, he definitely got tested multiple times. He made it to the fourth round, which is a championship round. He looked fine. He didn't look gassed. Stopped a lot of takedowns, got off the cage. Um, there was a, I mean, Tiago Santos is a beast, an absolute monster. He landed some big shots too, and uh, Jamal Hill was able to take it. And so, I mean, this is very much a you can consider it a grappler versus striker type of fight. Um, Glover does have hands. It's not like he's only a grappler. He's got really good boxing inside boxing. He's not a speed type of uh, striker. Not heavy strikes as far as uh, volume goes, but when he lands, people get hurt. Um, his his goal is to get to the fight to the ground, get the fight to the ground where he's best. Um, Jamal Hill has done a really good job at learning the ground game, uh, staying out of trouble, and getting it back to where he does best, and and that's laying these hands on people, man. Um, 
it hurts me to say this, but I have Jamal Hill winning by knockout. I think he's going to have a rough first round, and he's going to survive it. And I think he's his he's going to land a big shot on Glover, and it's going to really stun Glover. And I think Glover is going to hang for a little bit, and then he's going to get his lights put out. Unfortunately, that sucks because it's in Brazil, and you don't necessarily want to see a good guy like Glover go out like that. Um, I just have seen a lot in Jamal Hill that makes him pretty, in my eyes, undeniable at this point. I don't see Glover. I don't see Glover um, doing anything crazy and shocking, to be honest. I, I could see him winning by submission for sure. Again, like I said in the beginning, all five of these fights could easily go the other way. I don't think any of these fights are going to be just murders. Um, and this one could totally go the other way. I think you could totally see Glover getting a hold of Jamal and using some some sort of trip or something that maybe Jamal hasn't trained um, or just wear him down. I think I could see him taking Jamal into deep waters and uh, frustrating Jamal enough to make a mistake he shouldn't make and then capitalizing on that. So, uh, yeah, that, that's my main card preview. I uh, appreciate you guys listening. Um, if this is something you guys dig and you want to hear more often, let me know, and I'll do this again. Uh, check out the Mouthpiece Moment podcast. Love you guys.